It's no small thing to be almost going at the end after all of these great speakers. But here I am, and I am really, really, um, really, I feel very grateful to be here. Um, just one small correction. I've been with Organizing for Health, and what you'll hear me call OFH, for, since 2010, not 2001. And uh, I, I really came to this work uh, by virtue of my, uh, my work in the church. And um, honestly, the despair that I have felt in the church. And I say that I have felt this despair because I believe so deeply that the church is the most powerful agent of tra transformation that we have in this country. And where I live, Boston, Massachusetts, um, we have an opportunity in the midst of uh, what might be considered a very enormous challenge. And our opportunity is that um, many people describe where we live, where I live, as post-Christian. Does anybody know what that means? Raise your hand if you think you know what that means or are willing to share. Yes, go ahead. Yes, or where Christianity is a no longer the dominant um, cultural identification, where there are a number of different traditions that are uh, uh, prominent, and where you can't assume the way you can assume here, for example, that you can go in and say grace and not feel like someone who thinks very differently or believes very differently from you is going to be. Um, on board with that. And I think that what it's done for churches is that it's given the church kind of an opportunity to go back to its first century pose as a place of community, as a place of healing, a house church model where people go to a large, imagine the first century, they would go to the temple and they would get big teaching. And then they would go home, or they would go into small, small communities, and they would, they would reflect on what inspired them. So what I'm going to do now, well, I'm going to be talking about how we develop leadership in health ministry. But as Mandy said, um, a big part of what that's all about starts from here and goes to about here. It involves a lot of heart. These are very big changes that you all are being asked to make in your communities. And if you aren't connected to your heart, this work will be like swimming in a swamp, if it isn't already. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn this room into a small group. And the first thing I'd like to do is figure out who's here. So I would like for you to please tell me your name, where you're from. I know all of you are from sort of the same place, so if it's from someplace exotic, let me know. And also, just in a very short sentence, please, very short, because I don't want to get us messed up on time, what inspires you? Now, I, I want you to know that what inspires me is getting the opportunity to stand in front of a group like you and listen to your stories, because they are holy and they're sacred. And that's what we're going to do today. We are going to tell each other our stories. And I'm going to tell you why that's important, why that is a key leadership part, and why it's something that you should never leave out of any new endeavor, particularly one that involves any kind of any kind of uh, uh, moral resource, if you will. Um, the first thing I want you to take notice of is just group process, all right? So I started this process by bringing all of you into the room. We want to become a community of action. And that starts first with kind of gluing ourselves to one another. 
We've also been suspected that we have a number of values in common, the things that brought us here. But it, it is extremely important to bring those out and put them in the center of the room so that we all know who each other are. So we've, all, we've done a lot of meditating already on what kind of leader Jesus is, so I'm not going to say much more about that except to say that he was itinerant. He was a man out on the streets. He did not wait for people to come to him. Well, he kind of did. He didn't wait. He was walking along and it came to him. But he was on the road, right? He was moving. He was moving within the people. He wasn't waiting for the people to come to him. And I think if we're going to really be serious about following the example of Jesus, then we have to take this part of who he was seriously. The fact that he was in the midst of the people. That the incarnation meant that he was moving in the midst of the people. And that, for me, is a model of ministry. As I said, I think that the church often fights below its weight. I think we could be doing so much more, and I am so inspired at the thought that the church could reclaim the idea of Jesus' ministry of, of healing. And to understand that part of being church is to be concerned about the wellness of your people. Not just your souls, not that dichotomy that you know, somehow Western Christianity adopted, that the soul is somehow different from the body, but that all of, about all of us. So in my mind, my dream, my dream for the church is that we would be able to have churches that really embody this itinerant ministry of Jesus. That are really rooted, they're rooted in a deep sense of the gospel, a deep sense of who God is and what God did in Jesus, right? And what that means for us in the world, what we should be doing. And specifically here, what that means is, what does it mean for us to be followers of the itinerant Jesus in the context of health ministry. And if you're starting a health ministry in your church, that's an important question to begin with. If you're starting a health ministry in church, it's really, I, I would strongly suggest that the team you recruit, because you should not do this alone, Jesus didn't, you shouldn't. The team you should recruit should be starting from a theological reflection on Jesus as a healer. And there's lots of that in the Gospels. So what we're going to be talking about today is a certain approach to building a, a health ministry, if you will. And we're going to be talking about several principles that really ground what we do. Right? This approach is about recruiting and forming leaders building community around those leaders, and taking collective action for the mission of God. So we're going to be focusing today on one aspect of the leadership arts that we typically teach in the work that we do, but all of it is for the purpose of taking collective action. We're going to start with a very specific definition of leadership. My mentor, Marshall Gans, uh, came up with this definition, and I think it should, for me, it is foundational to the way I understand church leadership. He says, leadership is accepting responsibility, accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Some key elements here, okay? It's a decision. It's not a position. Somebody isn't appointing you leader. Somebody isn't bestowing authority on you, okay? It's something you decide to do in response to an intolerable condition in your world, in your communities. And I would venture to say to you that a number of you, particularly the lay people in this room, who are thinking about starting this, I think you all are in some way responding to an intolerable condition. So you all are already practicing this kind of leadership. Okay, 
The other aspect that makes this, I think, a very special and church-like uh, definition of leadership is that it's focused on the building the capacity of other people. It's not focused on your own power. Right? It's always outward looking, always looking out for other people. And it's grounded, deeply grounded, in some stated, well understood, shared values and interests. In this case, again, a deep reflection, a deep theological reflection on the itinerant healing ministry of Jesus. So, why does Marshall say that leadership and uncertainty go together? Any ideas why he might put those two together? If things are going along just fine, no problems, how much leadership do you, does an organization or a group or a team really need? What do they need? Good manager, right? But what about when that ship starts to get a little, Alexis's picture, what about there's a storm coming on that ship and it starts to get a little bumpy and people start to get a little nervous? Then what? Things get a little scary. They start to look to the leaders. Uncertain times require courage. And what leaders do in these times is they don't just tell you how to, how to solve the problem. They keep you grounded in why it matters. The change that you all are, being, are asking people to make, very, very difficult changes under the best of circumstances. If they can't understand the why, if they can't buy into the why, it's just going to be so hard, so much harder. So we're asking you to consider a model of leadership that really is focusing on the why. One of the goals that we have with this ministry is to have you think about not you yourself singularly as a leader, but you as part of a team, a team that's rooted. Those little bars here, that's, that's, that's your rootedness, your commitment to one another, to your church, to the values that got you there. Because we also know that this work can burn people out. Pretty badly. Pretty badly. So if you do it alone, you will get burned out. If you do it alone, it will not last. So this is the key to going to scale. This is the key to building sustainability. So we spend a lot of time in the work we do helping people form strong teams. Those kinds of teams that yield the results that Patty was talking about earlier. We talk a lot about decision making and norms and how to, how to have a team work so that it really trusts one another. We teach that in, in the context of five key leadership practices. We start with narrative, your story, why this matters, why you were called to this. And we ask you to use your story to engage with others, one-to-one -one, or in a house meeting, not an email, not Twitter, not a webinar, though we do a lot of those but to really build relationships one-to-one -one in your church, to then go to a strong team structure, and then, only then, only after you've done those things of really getting yourself solidified in a strong commitment to one another, do you then go about developing a strategy and taking action in the service of your goal. So, we're going to talk more about public narrative, but this is the focus of bringing together the why with the how. It is about talking about your own story that helps you kind of get over that motivational challenge. Okay? And we move to building relationships one-to-one -one that are grounded in those shared values. And this is the key to unlocking all of those resources that you're going to need to build, to build your health ministries. Like, I bet that the People's, um, people's Clinic I'll bet there were a lot of one-to-one -one meetings that happened before that thing got off the ground. I'll bet there were a lot of people asking for a lot of things. I'll bet this kind of thing was done very naturally. We just ask you to be intentional about it. I already said what we're going to do about building strong teams. The point of it is that you can't do it alone. 
This is where the fellowship lives, okay? The trust, the interdependence, and the engagement in regular spiritual and reflective practice. This is your small group, okay? Your team is your small group. So you develop a plan that's using the best of your resources to get to your goal, and then you're taking action. I'm just going to take two seconds to talk about what this might look like in your parish. We talk a lot about campaigns. I know you, Alexis, you talked about campaigns. Patty talked about campaigns. We put everything in the context of a timeline. We use deadlines very intentionally in our framework because deadlines create urgency. And we believe that it takes urgency to really get things done. You know, I don't know if you're anything like me, but raise your hand. If, you to, if you're to-do list, you do the most urgent thing at the beginning. You do, right, right. So, if you, if you give yourself a deadline on how you want to phase this out, chances are you'll get it done. So, we say the first thing you do is to develop your story, then launch a listening campaign. Other people call it needs assessments. We'll call it a listening campaign. What is God calling our community to do? What is the need in our community? Then a parish town hall meeting might be a way to suss that out. Then a kickoff announcement event for a clinic, say, or some kind of ministry. And then some parish-wide initiative. And then your next steps. And these yellow dots here, these troughs, this is where you pray and you evaluate and you reflect on your next steps. So you use the troughs in your campaign as moments of learning, as moments of discernment, and moments of prayer. Any questions so far? Okay. So, we're gonna really focus now on story. And what we say is that story is a key leadership art, right? If you don't learn to tell your story, someone, and as a leader, someone will tell it for you. So it's really, really important that you know your own story. There have been so many times that speakers have gotten up here today and I've been so curious why they're doing what they're doing. I would love to know. And I think it would just be such an incredible thing if we, if we learned the skill of naming that thing that's moving us into action, that thing that keeps this beautiful woman acting 24-7. She doesn't even know I'm looking at her. <laughs> so we say that narrative or story involves two kinds of knowing. The how in the head and the heart, the why. And social science um, and neuroscience even tells us that you need both to, to um, motivate effective action. So you've heard today a lot about how to develop a health ministry. You've gotten some excellent advice. I was taking a lot of notes. But if you can't come up with the story of why it matters and tell that story compellingly, you're probably not going to be able to inspire a lot of action. So that's your leadership challenge. And that's what we try to teach you to do in public narrative. Because values are communicated not from here, but from here. As St. Augustine said, it's one thing to know the good and an entirely other thing to love it, to love the good. So the why, your story on why you were called, why are you motivated, is about loving the good, loving or an understanding your call. So how do we do this as leaders? Well, we do this through sharing stories. What, constitute a, what, what constitutes a story? Did anybody watch TV last night? No? Oh, I did. I watched a detective show, The Mentalist. It started with the crime, right? The challenge was what was the mentalist going to do? 
And then the outcome was, oh, he figured it out. I think, I sort of fell asleep by that end of the time. Every story has three main elements in every culture. This has been studied. Trust me when I tell you this is 100% true. This is one of the few absolute statements you will hear in academia, okay? Every single culture tells stories and teaches through stories, and all stories have three elements. They have a character who's challenged, okay? Who makes a choice that results in an outcome. And the choice that the character makes says something about the character's values. Okay, so we're going to be asking you to share your story around this kind of construct. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to pair up and ask yourselves a number of questions. And this will be timed and um, this will be, uh, you will be asked to share with your neighbor and your neighbor will be asked to just listen. To just listen. Don't reflect back, just listen. Okay, because this is about you telling your story. All right? And I want you to answer these questions. When were you called? When did you feel yourself called to a health-related ministry or profession? What caused you to take this path toward action? Okay, so when were you called? What caused you to take this path? Now, what is your story of now? What is the intolerable condition that exists within your communities now that's moving you to action, that brought you here today? How is God calling you to address this? And who are the people that you need alongside you to join you in taking action? And what do you know about that? And what inspires you about that? So I'm gonna ask you to use some of the paper that you have on the table and to take about 10 minutes to silently develop answers to these questions. And then I will ask you to find a partner and share answers to these questions. Take five minutes each, but we'll time you. So um, are there any questions about the exercise? About why we need to do this? Okay. So start, to start reflecting, and thank you. Okay, so I'll tell you my story of why I was called to be here. As I alluded to earlier, uh, lately in particular, I've begun to feel like I go to church, I sit in the pew, and I feel like there's this invisible safety belt that comes over me. And I literally feel strapped in the chair. And I look around me, and I see all the other lay people strapped down as well. It's a, it's a very real image for me. And I feel like this is somehow linked to my ministry, my understanding of call. And that is to be a woman of action in the world around the gospel. And I do that through teaching people like you how to find their motivation for really, really hard work. Not only hard work in the church, um, but also in healthcare. Um, I do a lot of work with a community in South Carolina, ZIP code 29203 in Columbia, that has a lot of very similar health issues as you all. And what we do there is we're training the community, various coalitions within the community, to commit to a series of health goals that we're calling a covenant. We learned about that yesterday, around good health. And what I've noticed in my work, the providers and the payers, very, very enthusiastic about this program. The community, a lot of distrust. 
a lot of distrust. The churches are the beacon of hope. The beacon of hope for this campaign. And they are really stepping forward into leadership and that gives me such hope that this thing, this thing that you all are trying to do is real. And it's the thing that could loosen the seatbelt and enable people to get up and get out of their chairs. So I'm asking you all to commit to really digging deep in the next week or so with your story in prayer with your God. And then I'm asking you to see if you can't get someone to share your story with and to get their story too. And I want you to remember, if you don't remember anything else about what I've said to you today, just remember that if you are only focusing on trying to get people to move on the basis of what's the right set of facts, evidence-based practice, getting them to make the kind of changes that they need to make in order to impact their health, you need to appeal to the why, the heart. Without both, you won't motivate action. It's been really fun being here over the last couple of days, and I really love Moorhead, Kentucky. It's beautiful here. So thank you very much.